what's in it for both of us. So if you'd like a copy uh, of this document, I'd be happy to send it. I'd love if everyone started to use it. Hopefully it might make some changes and if it ever became the, the, uh, the standard in sourcing, I, I'd be so happy. It would save me a lot of headaches. Um, I was asked today to present a, a real case study. Now let's you know, get our hands dirty a little bit and look at some actual projects that we've done. Um, I call it a firewall, and I'll explain a little bit later why, but it's fundamentally an, an assembly agreement where components come from all over China, from various sub-suppliers, specialty manufacturers, and then are assembled under our roof. Um, in this case, we're talking about uh, uh, electronic car accessories. This is a, a large um, American manufacturer and distributor of auto parts. Um, their, their goods can be found in uh, Napa, AutoZone, you name it. And a few years ago, they approached my team to go out and find a supplier um, in China in order to help expand their, their line of products. So they wanted a quality product um, at, a, a comp at, a, uh, at a savings. So we went out and we researched about 30 suppliers in China. We narrowed it down to five that had the right quality, lead time, uh, of course, price, and service attitude. Um, however, there were a few key problems. The first was after we narrowed it down to those five suppliers who really could make the product, we learned that all of them were aggressively trying to open the market in the U.S. So they had they had recently hired English-speaking staff. They were attending the trade shows in America. Um, they were setting up sales and distribution overseas. So it became very clear that while you have a very high quality requirements, if you're going to educate the manufacturer to get to that level of quality that you deserve, you're really educating a, a potential competitor. Um, to complicate matters, it was the type of product that's very high volume, tight margin. So shipping the core elements, the core components to the U.S. for assembly would kill the margins. And it had a nice box that had the customer's brand name on it. This is an off-the-shelf product. So once that manufacturer of the electronic components saw the brand name, he could easily go to Napa and find out what it was being sold for and who's the buyer. So the most sensitive information was on the packaging. And after the cost of labor in America, uh, shipment across the, the ocean, it just didn't make sense to assemble it overseas. So the decision was made to find a third party in China to do the assembly, inspection, uh, and final packaging. And luckily enough, Passage Maker was selected for that. I promised uh, I didn't want to. I don't want to make this a sales pitch today. Of course, you're welcome to contact me if you need these services. But the goal of my presentation today is really to go over in detail how do you set up a secure firewall so that you can do it on your own with with your partners. Um, I think that uh, some of the the common overlooked items um, when you're setting up your your project, you're setting you're looking for a firewall. So basically, you have a bill of materials that are, say you're making a, uh, a toy with a battery that goes in the box. There's the, the specialty toy manufacturer, then there's a specialty battery manufacturer, then there's a specialized packaging. Those three components are found on your own, they're delivered to your assembly partner where they're inspected and put together and packaged. Um, we do this under a, a closed door, uh, under, a, under our roof, behind closed doors, under Western management, so the sub-suppliers, they don't see the big picture. That's the firewall. Um, the buyer is kept, uh, everything's in a transparent fashion, yet the sub-suppliers don't really know the end use or the end branding of the product, let alone the final assembly designs and specs. And of course, the, the buyer's customers don't have the ability to go through the firewall and hijack the supply chain. So in a nutshell, that's the concept. Let's go over the details on, on how, it, how to put it together. Um, the first is the partner, obviously. Um, if you're going to do this on your own, you want to make sure that you can A, trust your partner a lot because they're going to have access to all the sensitive information. You might have a partner out there already. Of course, there are third-party providers that can do it, but look at your supply chain. Maybe you have a testing facility. Uh, perhaps you have a logistics partner. Maybe you have a legitimate captive supplier that will lease you some of their warehouse space and staff in order to set up your own assembly center or firewall. The key is that they have space, labor, and they have to have good management in terms of documentation control. You're going to spend a lot of time setting up inspection standards, work instructions. You want to make sure that, that it's an ISO style factory that can control their documentation. Um, a common question that comes up is, well, how do you pay your, your assembly partner to build this secure firewall? 
Um, you could say that there are four elements in determining the cost. First, you have to look at the bill of materials, the raw material. Um, ideally, you go out and find the sub-suppliers on your own. So you find that battery supplier, you find the toy manufacturer, you find the, the, the packaging supplier, deliver those goods to, to the assembly um, center. If you ask your assembly partner to go out and source those goods for you, you've defeated the purpose, because most likely they're not a sourcing agency. Um, they're going to cut corners, maybe ask their friends that they know, cousins that have factories that make batteries, hey, deliver some batteries, we need to get it for 75 cents a pack. Maybe that's good quality, maybe it isn't. It might not be the most effective, efficient pricing. So you really have to look at both the suppliers uh, of the components as well as your assembly partner. So that's the first, the bill of material, including packaging. The second is warehousing. Um, you know, most of the, in Shenzhen for an international uh, warehouse, I'm talking concrete floors, forklifts, rack storage, a roof that doesn't leak, properly managed, about $2.50 a cubic meter a week. So that, that's, you can pencil that in for the cost of warehousing if you need to warehouse a lot of stock or finished goods. Um, the third component is by far the most important. And you could call this a per unit assembly inspection fee. Um, so the goods are delivered, they're put together, it's based on labor and management. How much energy and, and resources are, need, are needed to put the battery into the, into the toy, make sure it works, and put it in a box. Um, you'll often hear of trading companies that aren't efficient at setting up this firewall or the assembly center. They'll say, just pay me a percentage of the, of the value of the goods. That's very dangerous because it, the amount that you pay your assembly partner should be directly correlated to the amount of, of resources or energy that they have to put into your specific product. For example, um, let's compare putting together uh, an iPod and uh, a simple pen set. Well, maybe the iPod supplier, you know, they do, the, they do it right and the quality inspection is very easy. It's simply, is this the right color? Turn it on, does it work? Now that's a high value product, $20, $30, but the inspection requirements are very easy. So to pay a percentage of the value of the goods doesn't make sense. The converse is true. A simple pen set, uh, we, we've done pens where we had to do a 100% inspection of the pens because the supplier often had leaky pens, would get the color wrong, so it might take us a full minute to inspect one pen. And that's much more work, even though it's a, a less costly item than the iPod, for example. So my point is, Try to um, structure your, your compensation to the assembly partner based on the actual work that they do rather than a, a generic percentage of the value of goods. Um, the final component in this cost structure is the cost of logistics and export processing. Um, generally speaking, your assembly partner shouldn't make any money on the, on the exportation. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting a good price on shipping and it's clearing customs okay, perhaps you bring in your third party logistics provider, perhaps you use the, the assembly partners, but either way, the cost needs to be transparent so you know exactly how much is being allocated for the shipment. Um, that way you can tinker with things because sometimes your assembly partner, they're great at putting product together, but they might not have the connections with the shipping lines to get you the best, most favorable pricing. So if we were to look at some of the highlights, you could say, this structure 